Dr. Ranjani Parthasarathy is a professor in the Department of Information, Science and Technology, Anna University. Her area of specialization is computer architecture and networks. One of her special interests is Indian language technology systems. She is actively involved in research in all the areas and has over 50 publications to her credit. She has about 25 years of experience covering both industry and academics. Welcome to the UGC lecture series in computer science. This is a series of lectures on computer architecture that we are looking at. We have been looking at various aspects of computer architecture starting from, instru from instruction set design uh, all the way up to control design. So, right now we are looking at details of control unit design and within control unit design we have been looking at pipelining. So, if you look at what we were doing in the previous lecture, we looked at how pipelining can be used to improve performance of a system and we also looked at some of the issues that come in a pipeline. So, the issues that we looked at are typically uh, what we refer to as hazards. We looked at structural hazards, data hazards and control hazards. We mentioned that these are the three hazards. So, we also looked at how the data hazards can be handled by means of uh, either using the compiler or with the help of certain hardware techniques like forwarding. So, what we will look at in today's lecture is we will look at a little bit, bit more of detail on control hazards and then of course, we will see how this pipeline actually would be implemented for a typical architecture. So, we will look at the MIPS pipeline. So, we will look at how the MIPS pipeline is designed. Okay. So, um, just to do a quick overview of uh, pipelining. So, we said pipelining improves performance by increasing the instruction throughput. The idea with use in pipelining is that multiple instructions are executed in parallel. Each instruction will have the same latency, but because we are overlapping execution of instructions, we get improvement in performance. And as I said, it is subject to hazards. We have these three types of hazards, structural hazard, data hazard and control hazard. Structural hazards occur when we have two instructions requiring the same resource, same structure as such. Data hazards occur because of a flow of data that is when the output of one instruction is required as the input to another instruction. So, second instruction cannot proceed until the output is available. So, we then say that we have a data hazard, you will have to wait for the output to become available. Control hazards occur because of the flow of control when in an instruction sequence we have a flow of control and we do not know which is the direction in which the control is going to go, then you will not be able to determine which is the next instruction which has to be executed. So, that is the case that we need to understand clearly. Okay. And of course, the complexity of the pipeline implementation will be affected by the instruction set design. These are some of the general things that we have looked at. Now, we will look at some details of the control hazards and how they are handled. Control hazards basically are caused because of branches or any instruction which causes a change in the control flow. Now, the ones that we encounter very frequently are branch instructions. Okay. So, now we know that the branch determines the flow of control and the fetching of the next instruction depends on the branch outcome. So, when we are looking at for instance, a conditional branch instruction. So, you say branch if equal and then you are branching to a particular uh, location. Now, the branch outcome that is what is the condition of the branch unless I determine the condition of the branch, I evaluate the condition, I do not know which is the next instruction that has to be executed. If I say branch equal then go to um, say loop 1. Now, whether it is equal or not that has to be determined first. Depending on that, I will either be going to an picking up an instruction from loop 1 or I will be executing the next sequential instruction. So, in a pipeline when you are looking at putting instructions into a pipeline, now the pipeline cannot always fetch the correct instruction immediately okay, because let us say for instance we have a branch instruction just come into the pipeline it is in the IF stage, then it goes to the ID stage. When it goes to the ID stage, now we are ready to pick up the next instruction for the IF stage. Now, which instruction has, has to be fetched? Now, we do not know that because until the branch is executed, we will not know which instruction has to be fetched. So, that is where we have a problem. So, we say that whenever we encounter branches, we have a hazard, a control hazard that is ha that has to be handled. Okay. So, in the MIPS pipeline, in the example that we have been looking at in the MIPS pipeline, we need to compare registers and then we need to compute the target. Okay. So, if we want to re reduce this problem of control hazard, what we will need to do then is instead of comparing registers and computing the target in the uh, EXE stage or in the uh, later stages, you will have to do it early in the pipeline. That is, you can try to do it in the ID stage itself. So, in which case you will have to have some additional hardware that is added in the ID stage. 
So that is a special comparator which will be used just for the purpose of the uh, branch instruction to check whether the two registers are equal or not. So that can be done in the ID stage. So by adding some additional hardware, we can try to reduce the control hazards. But even then, until the ID stage is completed, that is until this comparison is done, you still cannot determine which is the next instruction to be executed. So you may still have a one clock cycle delay that may be caused even if you do, if you add some additional hardware to the ID stage. Okay? So this is to tell you that uh, control hazard is one of the serious problems that we need to understand clearly so because it needs to be handled correctly. If you look at this kind of a situation now, let us see how you will have stalls that are introduced whenever a branch is encountered. Okay? So now, if you look at this uh, situation here, I have an add instruction here and then I have a branch equal to instruction following that. Okay? So, um, you have an add dollar 4, 5 and 6. So, 5 and 6 are added and stored in 4 and so on. So, here branch equal to you are checking two registers 1 and 2 if they are equal then you are branching to a location 40. Okay? So, now we can see that um, the first instruction is fetched then it is decoded then the ALU operation takes place then data access takes place and register write takes place this is this is the sequence of operands for the first add instruction. Now, the branch instruction will come in one cycle later. So, when this is in the decode stage this is in the fetch stage. Now, the next instruction just to be fetched will have to be either fetched from this location 40 or it will have to be the next sequential instruction which comes in. Okay? Now, in our pipeline since in the ID stage even if we uh, let us say we have moved the uh, comparison to the ID stage. So, until the ID stage is completed the instruction fetch cannot happen. Therefore, in this clock cycle where I should actually have started one instruction fetch I do not start the instruction fetch here I stall the pipeline. So, remember what we mean by stalling the pipeline. Stalling the pipeline is that during that particular clock cycle no, in, no action will get done. So, if nothing is fetched here in this clock cycle you can see that in the next clock cycle then the clock cycle after that now this instruction should have come into the id stage but since nothing was fetched here there is a bubble that is created here so in the id stage also in this clock cycle there will be a bubble this bubble now will go to the next stage which is the exe stage in the third clock cycle and go to the memory stage in the fourth clock cycle and so on so you can see that this bubble is the one that is kind of is introduced now whenever a bubble is introduced a bubble basically is what we are looking at is just as a indication to say that nothing is being done over there it is an empty slot over there. So, it is an empty slot that is there and this empty slot keeps moving from stage to stage. And then in the next clock cycle after a one clock cycle delay depending on the outcome of the branch because we have evaluated the outcome of the branch you can either fetch the instruction from location 40 or from the next sequential instruction. So, this instruction fetch therefore can happen only after one clock cycle. Okay? So, you will see that there is an additional delay in the next 200 picoseconds I should have fetched the next instruction. But now I wait for one more 200 picoseconds and only after 400 picoseconds you are fetching the next instruction. Okay? So, this is what we need to do whenever a branch is encountered that is we will have to stall until the branch outcome is known. So, the question that comes next is can I always be stalling whenever a branch is encountered. Now, what is interesting to note is that when we look at actual program execution we find that many a times many of our programs have lot of loops in it. So, whenever you have a loop you obviously will be having a branch instruction there as at the at the end of that loop. And it has been found that in many of the code that is written in most of the code that is written about one in every four to six instructions happens to be a branch. Now, you can see that that is a very very large frequency of branches. Okay? So, stalling every time that a branch is encountered can be a very expensive solution because we are looking at improving performance. So, if you want to improve performance and you have to stall for every branch instruction that is encountered then you will find that performance will not be as good as we would expect it to be. So, what we do therefore, is we look at other schemes okay, we typically we use what are called as prediction schemes to see if we can predict how the branch will go whether it is going to be taken or not taken and based on that try to start executing the pipeline earlier. So, we are trying to reduce the number of stalls of course, your prediction can go wrong. So, if your prediction goes wrong then we will have to have mechanisms for tackling the misprediction. Okay. So, let us look at how branch prediction is done. Stalling on branches becomes even more of a problem when you have longer pipelines. Now, in this particular pipeline that we had looked at the MIPS pipeline we only had a one clock cycle stall because we were able to calculate the um, branch condition evaluate the branch condition in the ID stage itself. Now, that may not be possible in all pipelines especially when you have very deep pipeline architectures very long pipelines are you are there you will not be able to 
to uh, evaluate the branch instruction branch outcome early. So, in that case the number of clock cycles that you will have to stall will, will, will even increase further. Okay. So, which is the reason why prediction has been used as one of the um, strong uh, schemes to handle the branch uh, stall the stalls which come out of the branches. So, what do we do in branch prediction? So, what we are trying to do basically says whenever a branch is encountered we try to see what is likely to be the outcome of this branch. Let us say you have a branch and you have predicted that it is going to be taken. If it is taken then you know that you will be able to fetch the instruction from the branch target and you will start executing it from there. But if your prediction goes wrong then you have to undo whatever you have done. Okay? So, then you will have a stall. So, there is stall only if the prediction is wrong, but if your prediction is correct then you can just continue execution. Okay? This is the basic idea. So, in the MIPS pipeline if we look at how we are doing it in the MIPS pipeline you can predict branches as not taken that will be the easiest thing to do because if I predict branches if I am able to predict the branches which are not taken then all I need to do is if it is not taken remember what is going to happen the next instruction to be fetched is the next sequential instruction. So, all we need to do is you just fetch the instruction after the branch with no delay and bring it into the pipeline and execute it. This is we are assuming that if the branch is predicted as not taken we just have to fetch the next sequential instruction nothing ex extra needs to be done just as you would have fetched the uh, series of instructions sequence of instructions you fetch the next instruction bring it into the pipeline and let it flow through the pipeline. Now, if your prediction was wrong then we will have to undo the effect of this instruction okay, that is what we have to do. So, let us look at what happens when the prediction is correct and not correct in this in the RMIPS pipeline for instance. Okay, so, let us say we had an add instruction and then the uh, branch equal to instruction that is followed by a load instruction. So, let us say we have predicted that the branch is not taken okay, MIPS with predict not taken. So, not taken indicates that branch the load instruction is the instruction which is immediately following the branch this is the next sequential instruction. So, it is not taken this is the instruction that should have been executed. So, if the prediction is correct look this will be the sequence of events that will happen branch equal to would have come into the pipeline the second clock cycle right it is fetched here and while it is being decoded I would have fetched the next instruction which is the load instruction. So, after 200 picoseconds itself this instruction would have come into the pipeline okay, and it will get fetched. Now, by the time this comes to the decode stage we know that this the branch outcome would have been determined therefore, I know that the branch is not taken that this equal to condition was not met therefore, I should continue with the execution of this instruction which has already come into the pipeline. So, I just continue the execution of this instruction. So, now this instruction will go to the ID stage go to the exe stage the next clock cycle and so on. Okay, so, this is what will happen if the prediction was correct. Now, what will happen if the prediction was incorrect? Let us see what happens here. In this clock cycle, the branch instruction is fetched and it goes into the decode stage. Now, what would I have done? I would have actually fetched this instruction in this clock cycle, right? It would have come in over here, but at the end of this clock cycle, that is when the at the end of the ID stage of the branch, you will know that the branch actually has to go to location 40. So, which means your prediction that it was not taken is not correct okay, is incorrect. So, it is an incorrect prediction therefore, you have now fetch from this new address of 40. So, I get a new instruction or instruction that needs to be fetched. Now, this instruction is fetched in the next clock cycle okay, when this is fetched in the next clock cycle you can see that already there was an instruction which had come in. Now, this effect of this instruction has to be undone. So, you need to stall the pipe the you have to introduce a bubble here undo the effect of this load instruction should have come into the pipeline and instead execute this OR instruction. Okay, This is what will happen. So, you will see that there will be a one clock cycle that is something came in that is basically not to be executed. Therefore, you will have to undo the effect of this which is like saying that one bubble is introduced or one clock cycle is wasted, but you get the correct execution after that one clock cycle. So, even though we do a prediction you can still make sure that the um, that if the prediction goes wrong you get correct execution. So, we will take a short break and then come back and continue later on this. Welcome back after the break. So, we were just looking at how branch prediction is used. So, we just uh, were talking about what happens when the prediction is correct and when the pred prediction is incorrect. Now, one of the things which is very easy to do is to predict the branches not taken because you can see that if it is not taken then it is the sequential flow of instructions that are going to be executed. So, it is very easy to handle these cases, but if you look at more realistic branch prediction mechanisms 
we actually have two classes of branch prediction mechanisms static branch prediction and dynamic branch prediction. So, static branch prediction is typically done by the compiler. So, the compiler would schedule code based on certain prediction mechanism that it would use. And uh, how would the compiler know what uh, how to how what will be the actual behavior of a branch? This based on typical branch behavior. So, one of the thumb rules that is that we use is, is like this. For example, if you look at loop and uh, if statement branches, you predict the backward branches as mostly taken and if it is a forward branch, we will predict it as not taken. So, as I was telling backward branches correspond typically to loops and loops get taken most of the time. Forward branches will typically correspond to certain exceptional conditions. If some exception then you may branch out of a loop or something like that. So, we say that which will normally correspond to forward branches. So, we say that forward branches are not taken most of the time. So, using this kind of a simple technique you can actually predict statically the branches quite well. Okay. So, this is some a technique that is normally used as static branch prediction mechanism. We can do better than this and go in for dynamic branch prediction. So, in dynamic branch prediction what we do is you actually look at the branch behavior that is the hardware will measure the actual branch behavior that is it will record the recent history of each branch and based on the recent history of each branch it will then predict what the future behavior is going to be do a kind of a trend analysis. You see that this branch has been taken most of the time. So, it is likely to be taken the next time also. Okay. So, like that we have certain um, dynamic branch prediction mechanisms. Static branch prediction gives you only a certain amount of accuracy, but dynamic branch prediction has been proven to give much higher accuracy. Okay. Only thing is when it is wrong again you will stall because you will have to refetch and then you will update the history again. Okay. So, that is those are certain issues that we have to deal with. We will not go into details of this, but you, you should understand that there is something called a static branch prediction and dynamic branch prediction and for dynamic branch prediction you need hardware support. Okay. So, most of the processors today have some kind of dynamic branch prediction mechanisms. So, which is why we need to understand that this is a technique that is used in today's processors. Now, coming back to our MIPS pipeline path with the pipeline let us look at what is going to happen in, in each stage. So, we have said that with the MIPS pipeline that we have we have these five stages right the IF stage, the ID stage, EX stage, MEM stage and the write back stage. So, let us look at what is going to happen here. Now, in the normal pipeline that we looked at so far, okay, we said that we divided up into these five different stages. Okay. What we also need is a set of registers between the different stages. Now, you will come to why we need this these registers in between. So far, we just said that if you divide it up into five stages and let the instructions flow through the pipeline, we will be able to get pipeline execution. Now, in order for that to happen correctly, we need certain additional hardware. Okay. So, that is what we are trying to take a look at now. So, that one of those additional hardware we require are these registers between the stages. Now, you can very easily see why we need the registers between the stages. Okay. So, now the registers basically will be used to hold information which is produced in the previous cycle. Okay. So, for instance, uh, when I have an instruction in the IF stage, in the next stage, in the next clock cycle, this instruction will come to the ID stage. Now, when this instruction comes to the ID stage, the outcome of this previous stage, right, that is end of the IF stage you will have the instruction fetched and so on. So, the instruction fetched which will be there let us say in some instruction register the op code and then the register values and so on all these will have to be held in this register. Okay. We call these registers we normally name the registers using the previous stage and the next stage that it is connecting. So, this is the IF stage and this is the ID stage. So, we call this as the IF slash ID interstage register. Similarly, this will be an ID slash EX interstage register this will be ex slash mem interstage register, this will be a mem slash write back interstage register. Since different instructions are there in the different stages, the information corresponding to those instructions should be carried along with the instructions, which is why we need these registers and you need to carry information from one register to another register as the instruction progresses. Okay. So, registers are required. Okay. Now, when we talk of a uh, pipeline operation in terms of depicting it okay, just to um, a diagrammatic representation as such, we normally look at it as a cycle by cycle flow of instructions. Okay. And when we do the cycle by cycle flow of instructions, you can look at one view as a single clock cycle pipeline diagram, another view would be to look at it as a multi clock cycle diagram. Okay. So, a multi clock cycle diagram will give you the graph of the operation over time. A single clock cycle diagram will tell you how the pipeline is 
used in a single cycle okay it will highlight the resources used okay so we will take a look at both these representations now for a load and store instruction okay so let's look at this now as we look at this flow of instructions for a load or store instruction we will also see how the data path has to be designed correctly for this pipeline mechanism to work correctly okay so let's look at this now let's say we are having a load or a stored instruction in the if stage okay so which are the parts that are getting used in an if stage here in the if stage you will see that instruction memory will be accessed the pc will be incremented and so on okay and that value will be stored in the ifid registers this is what will happen in the if stage the next clock cycle this instruction now will come to the id stage so the instruction decode stage so here the registers will be accessed and a sign extension will be done for the address calculation and so on and the output of this will be stored in the id slash ex interstage register in the next clock cycle it will come to the exe stage in the ex stage this mux which will be used to select this address and the effective address calculation will be done by, with the help of the alu and that effective address which is calculated will be stored in the ex slash mem stage in the next clock cycle this is the actual memory access that takes place so the address will be given and the memory is accessed and the data that is read out will be stored in the mem slash write back register okay in the next clock cycle what happens the write back has to take place so the data which is stored over here has to be written back into the corresponding register here okay so now look at what happens here now you can see that now which is the register that i need to write into the register i need to write into has to be specified by this instruction right the instruction load the instruction which is right now in the write back stage now instead if you look at the actual pipeline design the way it is right now you can see that the register selections are coming from the ifid stage and now you will actually have a different instruction in this ifid stage so you will have the wrong register number which is specified here if you didn't take care of this properly okay you get the, the point here point is now i have another instruction here this instruction is the one that is writing back but which is the register it needs to write back that also has to be specified by this instruction okay so what we need to do therefore is you need to correct the data path for this that is from here i have to bring back information along with this data that is to be written to say that this is the register that needs to be written okay so you will see that this write register now with the pipeline architecture this write register will be specified either by this instruction it will not be specified by this instruction instead it will be specified only by the instruction which is there in the write back stage okay you can see that there is a slight difference here earlier we were assuming that this write register all this is just taken from this ifid stage here right so that will give us wrong output because the register to be written has to be specified by the instruction which is in the write back stage so along with the write back information which is the value to be written to the register the register to which you need to write into that also has to be given back over here okay so this will be a correction that needs to be done for the pipeline data path to work correctly for the load instruction okay so you can see now how the sequence of events will be for a store instruction now for a store again if and id stage will be similar to that of a load in the um, ex stage also is it's similar the mem stage you can see that slightly different what is different here the data a store is storing data into memory right so the data that is to be stored right which would have come which would have been read from a register here okay which is what you would have seen in this previous thing so our values read from the register is stored in this ex mem register and from here the write data and the address that is calculated are given to the memory and the store gets completed here okay in the next clock cycle the write back stage for a store nothing really happens okay so that is uh, because when the store is writing to memory okay so this is what happens here now let's look at this um, multi cycle pipeline diagram so if you look at the multi cycle pipeline diagram so what are we trying to show here you are trying to show how the different instructions are in different clock cycles so this is a typical representation we use so you have clock cycle shown here time shown on this uh, x axis that you can say and then down here we are showing the different instructions so you can see what is happening here the load instruction comes into the if stage in the first clock cycle goes into id in the second clock cycle does execution of the third clock cycle data memory fourth clock cycle does the register write in the fifth clock cycle okay so this is the load uh, instruction then you have the sub instruction you can see in clock cycle 2 it will come into the if stage access the instruction memory then register access id is done in the third clock cycle and so on so you can see that so if you have a snapshot of the pipeline like this you can see for instance in the clock cycle 5 right if you look at clock cycle 5 
you can see the fifth instruction is in the fetch stage, the fourth instruction will be in the decode stage, third instruction is in the exe stage, second instruction is in the uh, memory access stage and the first instruction will be in the register write back stage. Okay. So, you can see what is actually happening at every clock cycle and what are the different instructions which are getting executed. Okay. This is a, a typical representation that we use. Another way of showing it will be instead of um, showing these uh, diagrams over here like this, you can just write it as fetch decode execution data access and write back. Okay. This is another way in which you can show the uh, pipeline uh, diagram. Now, if you look at a single cycle pipeline diagram, okay, so here we are looking at in a given cycle. Okay, what is it that is happening? So, in a given cycle, if I look at the a, a similar sequence of uh, instructions coming in, okay, at a given cycle, you will have a different instructions in these different stages. Okay. So, for instance, a load is in the write back stage, a sub instruction is in the memory stage, an add instruction is in the execution stage, a load word is in the, in the decode stage and another add instruction is there in the instruction fetch stage. So, this is another way in which you can depict the state of the pipeline. Now, the next thing we need to look at is how do I get the control signals for, for a pipeline design. Okay. So, if you look at this control signals are derived from the instruction just as in the case of a single cycle implementation. Now, look at what happens in a single cycle implementation. The moment I get the instruction after it has been fetched from the instruction by looking at the opcode and the various um, register information that is there, you can generate all the control signals. right? So, we do the same thing here, we generate all the control signals here, but only thing is some of those control signals have to be affected when the instruction goes into the EX stage. Some control signals have to be used when it goes into the MEM stage and some control signals when it goes into the write back stage. So, what we do therefore is generate all the control signals here, but carry the signals along with that instruction okay, and use those control signals at the appropriate stages, so, which is why you can see the control signals here. We have an EX. M and write back. So, in addition to the registers that we talked about here, the interstage registers also will have this control information which will flow along with the instruction. Okay, This is what will happen. So, you can see that this is a more comprehensive picture here. Controls are generated in the ID stage and the controls are sent from here to the EX stage, carried from here to the memory stage of the next interstage register used in that stage appropriately. Similarly, write back again you can see will flow over here gets used in the write back stage appropriately. So, it is important to see that the information is sent to the correct stages okay, and done in the exact clock cycle because the uh, control information has to match the instruction that is being executed. Okay, this is what we need. So, um, so, basically in designing the control unit these are the points that we need to remember. One is that it is based on the instructions and you have to identify the correct logic which is required and you have to identify and make sure that the data path is correct. Okay. And then you have to derive the control information from the instruction okay, and identify the critical path and therefore, you need to take all these things. Now, these are things which are general even for any control unit design, but all these now have to be looked at from the point of view of a pipeline design. So, that is what we need to do. So, to summarize, so what we have looked at in today's lecture are the following. One is we have looked at handling control hazards in the pipeline. So, we looked at we talked about something called prediction branch prediction, static branch prediction and dynamic branch prediction. And then we also looked at how the MIPS pipeline data path is designed. Okay. We also looked at designing the control for the MIPS pipeline. We talked about issues that are there in designing the control. We have to uh, the point to remember is that the control signals have to flow along with the instruction. So, which means they also have to be carried from one interstage register to another interstage register when the instruction moves from one stage to another. Okay. So, um, that that is the important part that the control signals have to be provided correctly so which is what we have seen today. So, a few questions to look at uh, today's to uh, take a look at today's uh, content. Question number 1 what is a control hazard? Question number 2 what are the options to handle control hazards? Question number 3 draw the pipeline diagram and identify the hazards in the following code sequence. Okay, you have a code sequence here which consists of the following instructions load r1 comma hash 100 of r2 now i have given r1 r2 r3 as registers here so you can uh, um, this will the the first will be the uh, destination and then which is followed by the source registers so add r3 comma r1 comma r2 this indicates that r1 and r2 are added and then stored in r3 the usual convention that we have been following in this course and then you have a store instruction and then an add and then a branch so identify 
the uh, hazards in this. Question number 4, what is the purpose of interstage pipeline registers? Question number 5, how are the control signals generated for the pipeline execution? Thank you.